Kickstarter. Bro, who security think he is? Bro, y'all look, look at the hand. Bro, hold up. She began to cry uncontrollably. Mackenzie Shiro. Bro, who the f- <laughs> Hey, bro, who the f- you think he is? Come on, one more time. As Shiro was handed Hold up, what'd he do? She began y'all do it with me. Mackenzie Shiro. Bro, who the f- Yeah, go! Like, bro! Who he do- Bro! Bro, I don't know. Yo, this shit got me crying, bro. <laughs> Y'all tune in, man. He's gonna get funnier and funnier. Talk to the ones on the kisser. Stop from full of scissor. Talk to the last name, lizard. Everything I got, I is her. Reach, he getting his hurt. Roll a leaf over on Swisher. Oh, my chick. I know I get crazy on that liquor. Pop a yard, get out of his body. Double eyes, I feel like Roddy. White boy, we ride with Tommy. Scott, I got that blibber. YouTube, what's good? G, it's your boy, Kim Money Bag, and I'm back with another video. Y'all hear that Lil' Zay Osama though? What'd he say? When it's over, I want to create generation of wealth. Uh, 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 put it on the shelf. Live by the gun, die by the gun, got two under my belt. If I keep giving it to everybody, I ain't gonna have nothing for myself. I wanna have 10 kids. I wanna buy that mansion. There we go. And I'm speaking. But yeah, y'all, so today we're gonna do another courtroom video, man. Y'all know these ones get a little crazy. You feel what I'm saying? But yeah, we're gonna put it down here. Put my little my little punk ass right there. So today's video is gonna be dangerous teens reacting to life sentences. Let's see how this is, man. Let's see how we can kind of you know go about this video. Hold up, there we go. Nicholas Lindsay. This is Nicholas Lindsay, a 17 year old from St. Petersburg, Florida, making his appearance at the Pinellas Pasco Circuit Court after committing a crime that got him found guilty of first degree murder, resulting in a sentence of life imprisonment. My last text with him was me saying, be safe, Dad, I love you. To he, which he immediately replied, I will, sweetheart, I love you too. That was one hour before Lindsay went to shooting him. The voice you just heard is that of Amanda Crawford, the daughter of St. Petersburg police officer David Crawford, who lost his life after a deadly encounter with Nicholas Lindsay on February 21st, 2011. Officer David Crawford responded to a 911 call about a possible burglary near Tropicana Field. The caller claimed he saw a man holding a brick in his backyard, who later jumped the fence. Officer Crawford quickly arrived at the scene and exited his vehicle when he spotted the mystery burglar, who was later identified as Nicholas Lindsay. Perhaps seeing that the suspect was only a teenager, Crawford's greatest undoing was to believe that he had the situation under control. According to the police, Nicholas Lindsay opened fire on David Crawford as the officer reached for a notepad every single <laughs> damn that's crazy bro and you know what's different is a lot of these young kids these age bro be willing to crash out like 2.5 like be a lot of these young kids really be willing to crash out like over nothing bro i swear to god like you know and that's why i say it's very important to take your life serious because like in an instance everything really could be gone bro i said that's crazy though bro and just imagine that though you being 14 15 well, let's say anything under 18 or even 18, bro. You being in those, um, you being like that age bracket or whatever, and you really got to look up and understand that you ain't even get to live life yet and everything going. School, sports, everything you was looking forward towards. College, everything. Everything just out the window. And now it ain't never going back. That's deep. Shot he fired was exactly where he aimed at the body. Officer Crawford. Officer Crawford managed to fire six rounds from his Glock, but none of the bullets hit Lindsay as he fled from the scene. Another officer found the wounded 25-year veteran on the ground and immediately called for medical support. David Crawford was pronounced dead at Bayfront Medical Center. Crawford's death quickly made the news, leading to a massive manhunt for the killer, drawing in more than 200 police officers from different agencies across Tampa Bay. Yo, that's different though. Y'all see how deep they go for their own peoples, bro. I promise you, like, you know, a lot of the times, you know, when stuff like this happens, you know, sometimes they they tend to, you know, like, so, well, in some cases, like, half-ass the search or, you know, half-ass whatever crime happened, you know. Sometimes they take a person probably, what, years, they be on the run for not long until they get found. But you take one of their con, boy, that shit like the motherfucking, how can I explain this shit, bro? Damn, I can't. Now, I don't even know. I don't even know what I could, um, 
I don't even know what I can relate this to, but like I'm telling you, you take one of the Akon, boy, you got a swamp after your ass. And that's... The manhunt ended on the night of February 22nd, 2011, when police received several tips from the community that led to a raid on an apartment where Nicholas Lindsay lived with his mother, Denise Sweat, and brothers. Sweat later told ABC affiliate WFTS that she knew something was wrong when the police came to her apartment, but she let them in. After finding out the reason why the police wanted her son, Sweat wasn't caught in two minds about her next action, and she immediately told her son he needed to cooperate with the police. Still speaking to WFTS, Sweat said, I told my son, man up, and tell what happened. And he did that. Sweat was with her son when he confessed to killing Officer David Crawford. According to Police Chief Chuck Harmon, Lindsay didn't hold back any details as he tearfully confessed to the murder after much pleading from his parents. I thought it was on safety, but it wasn't. Why record podcasts, son? Thought it was on safety, but it wasn't. Brought him low ass headphones. Yeah. And you could use Riverside. Switch them. Harmon went on to add, when he did make the admission on tape for us at the end of the day, it was quite apparent that he was remorseful in his actions. In his confession, Lindsay claimed he shot at Crawford's stomach with a gun he had bought for $140 off the streets a week before the incident. The then 16-year-old also told the police he couldn't recollect how many times he fired at Crawford. However, the police later revealed that Lindsay had fired at least four rounds at the unsuspecting police officer. The killer teen fled from the scene and threw his gun into a creek. The murder case attracted much media attention because Crawford was the third police officer to die in St. Petersburg in less than a month. Unsur Damn, so it's like, so it's basically like with his case or whatever, they was already on the go about, you know, a lot of this stuff happening. It's just that, and you know, like, it's crazy. It's like, it's crazy that in his head, you know, he did, he did whatever he did, not even knowing that his his reaction to whatever situation happened was damn near like the last straw. So it's basically like you could kind of tie this into into you know like back in school life for how if a motherfucker always getting bullied, then one day that motherfucker just man up and he like fuck it, this the last straw. He like bah, he start whooping that nigga ass and coming, mm, mm, he stopping him out or whatever, or he telling him his shit I'm fried. Yeah, I get y'all one of these, but. But y'all know, like, like I was saying, like, how he finally got his last stroke. Like, bro, I can't handle none of this shit. It's crazy because with all the situation going on with the cops or whatever, he didn't even know one of these last incidents he did was going to be the last straw. And that's probably, well, that's why they went so hard to go on um, to go find him. Surprisingly, the Pinellas County Courthouse was packed with reporters the next day as Nicholas Lindsay was formally charged with the murder of David Crawford. Although Lindsay had previously been charged in the juvenile system's truancy court, a murder trial was unfamiliar territory for the teenager. Inside the courtroom, Lindsay shockingly showed little emotion. Still, his father, Nicholas Lindsay Sr., broke into tears as he apologized to the family and friends of the slain officer. The visibly distraught father said, On behalf of me, a son, Speaking inside the courtroom, Officer Crawford's partner, Sue Crisco, explained he has found it difficult to forgive Nicholas Lindsay, saying, According to my faith, I'm supposed to forgive you. I do not know that I will ever be able to do that. Stu Crisco added, And I hope that you live to be a very old man. Locked up, and every single day that you were locked away, that you could think of the choices that you made that night and all the things that you missed. After a week long trial in March 2012, 17 year old Nicholas Lindsay was convicted of David Crawford's murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Although Damn, Lindsay see? And that's crazy. Look how fast you really could throw your whole life away, bro. And that's, I forgot how they call it, what they say, one five second rule, cause. Could end everything, something like that. Y'all know the context I'm saying, but I said that's crazy. I said, look how what was it? Four shots. Look how four shots the one person took his whole life away, bro. And like he young as hell. And see how you know the officer, you know his partner was like, I don't think I'll be able to forgive you and all that. And like I said, that stuff is deep, man. So when they sit up here in these courtrooms and they start wilding or they be all over the place, I get it, like. I get that the judge and the courts and the um people in the courtroom be trying to actually you know make the stuff organized. And they don't be trying to cause more commotion, but bro, it's hard to actually sit up here and be in the same room with somebody that took well, I'm gonna say called traumatic experiences. Y'all know my little term, 
Don't steal it. And I'm going to get a trademark on it. But y'all, you know, for somebody to sit up here and call traumatic experiences to you, your family, and, you know, your peoples or whatever, at the end of the day, you can't really sit in the same room with them and try to really, like, just be, like, OD calm. It's just that, you know, the only part about not forgiving, though, is that, like, you still hold that, like, like remorse, that, that grudge in it, though. But I say, you know, you should forgive in context. I say, you know, forgive in a sense of, like, letting go to let your soul be free, but you don't got to fuck with the person. I think people be trying forgiving and to be cool now. Like, nah, still, you know. He was tried as an adult. His age was still pivotal in helping him to avoid the death penalty. Two years later, Lindsay's life sentence was upheld in court following an appeal, and the convicted killer shocked everyone when he grinned on hearing the judge's ruling. Many were taken aback by the lack of remorse shown by the teenager, especially David Crawford's daughter, Amanda. While speaking to reporters after the ruling, Amanda called out Lindsay's awkward reaction in the courtroom. Justice reserved, and I thought it was over. It just kind of proves to me that he's an animal. Tell me how you Don't start, bro. Don't start, bro. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Dan to right. When it comes to shocking reactions to life sentences from teenage killers, very few come close to the chilling smiles and unbothered disposition of 18-year-old Danta Wright, who was appearing at the Washtenaw County Trial Court, Ann Arbor, Michigan, for the gruesome murder of 18-year-old high schooler Jordan Clee. Jordan Clee was a senior at Pioneer High School and also one of the best footballers in his school. He dreamt of going to college at Michigan University and joining their football team. Unfortunately, that dream never materialized, as Clee didn't even make it to his high school graduation. On October 4, 2016, Clee was found dead by a maintenance worker at an apartment complex at Pine Lake Village, Ann Arbor. He had a single gunshot wound to his head, and his body was lying on a path outside the condominium complex. Really sad. <laughs> really sad. Everyone was crying and stuff. It's been long. And I said, you know, like, big loss for the teachers and everything. It's crazy that to really know that somebody like this has so much potential behind them and that everybody is seeing it up front, you know. It's one thing for a person to have goal, dream, aspirations, and, you know, they keep it to themselves or, you know, they kind of move kind of, like, you know, solo with it. But y'all know, like, you know, in high school or college when people playing football, basketball, uh, volleyball, whatever sport, or they in these, like, you know, frat teams or, you know, um... That they playing varsity, you know, uh, JV or whatever, and you know they're really popular. You know, that's like, that's like a um, what's that? Like you know that person, you know, has a lot of responsibility due to the fact you know um, these sports teams are looking for him. You know, the teachers look up to him. He's inspiring people. So that's crazy to know that a person had all that. I ain't even gonna say all. That. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna say potential, but you know I'm gonna say like you know like. A great drive, a great drive and ambition, you know, they have all that shit going for them and just to be, just for all that to be taken away and never come back. Boss for the teachers. Police officers were immediately called to the scene and a thorough investigation was launched after the death was ruled as a homicide. Following some tips, three suspects were arrested in connection with the killing of Jordan Clee, Danta Wright, Delano Gracie, and Jamarius Ellison. They were all teenagers at the time of the crime and allegedly belonged to a street gang. Several months after Jordan Clee's death, Danta Wright left everyone stunned when he casually confessed to killing Clee with the help of his friends during a June 2017 hearing. Wright explained that the trio had attempted to rob Clee when things went south, and he shot him in the back of his head. And as a result of that armed robbery, um, what did you do with that gun and Mr. Jordan Clee? Shot him. Where did you shoot him? On the top. That was it. And did, did you kill him with that shot? Yes. A month later, Danta Wright met with the victim's family members at a Washtenaw County courthouse in Michigan. However, anyone who came to the courthouse expecting a peaceful proceeding was left disappointed after the court was briefly thrown into confusion after the judge threatened to reject the sentencing agreement due to Danta Wright's appalling behavior in the courtroom. As a family member read an impact statement on behalf of the victim's grieving mother, Danta Wright could be seen smiling and almost laughing at the pain of his victim's family, not paying any attention to Wright's embarrassing display of petulance, the family member left most of the crowd seated in the court in tears with the closing paragraph of Karen Clee's impact statement. Bro, that shit is deep, bro. And you really gotta go deeper with it. Like, 
these like these people, you know, whatever, you know, they're talking to their family. Their families are seeing them grow. Their families are seeing them progress and everything. So it's kind of like an expectation put out there that, you know, they want to see their family member in a certain light. They want to see their family member doing certain things. And just to look up and realize all that stuff is gone. Like how you really could be chilling with somebody today. Y'all chilling, y'all kicking it, y'all on the phone. You know, y'all giving each other advice. Y'all talking to each other about new things that's going to happen. I'm sure he wanted the best for his family and they wanted the best for him. They're looking forward to him going to college. They're looking forward to him looking up to all these big dreams and just to have all that come down and especially unexpectedly, you know, like I'm saying, um, well, as far as I, I hear from them, I don't think the other guy was in the game, you know, like, um, regular guy, you know, going to, um, school, playing sports or whatever. And, you know, I don't think, you know, he was indulged in any of that type of stuff. And it's like the context as well to hear, you know, how, uh, YouTube, I'm trying to be nice. To hear how this person, I can say, went out. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, went out. We're not gonna say, you know, the other stuff. You know, YouTube a little too sensitive, punk and niggas. But you know, like I could just say, like how you know, like how this person went out or whatever. And when you look at the context, it's like you know, this person, you know, wasn't even in that type of realm, or this person even they didn't even have that stuff, you know, involved or you know, or like around them. And it's like for that to happen, you know, I know it hit a little harder for his family. Lost laughter and love. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and everyday life. Danta Wright further angered the already irritated judge when he addressed the court. Instead of apologizing to his victim's family, the killer teenager chose to send a shout out to his own family. He casually said, I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon. Or I'll be keen. I love my family. At this point, the 22nd Circuit Court Judge David Swartz had just about had enough of Wright's attitude, and he asked the prosecutors if the sentencing agreement was too lenient. He said, But watching you sit there, smile, and laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial, and if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. The court then proceeded on a short recess to allow the prosecution to deliberate on whether to take the case to trial, as the judge had suggested. Ultimately, Jordan Klee's family asked that the case not go to trial, as that would only bring them more trauma. When the sentencing resumed, Wright's lawyer apologized to the court on behalf of his client and blamed the inappropriate behavior on some emotional issues suffered by Wright. Judge David Swartz subsequently imposed a 23, 50 years prison sentence on Danta Wright for the murder of Jordan Klee. With how grim prison experience is, hopefully Danta Wright has kept a smile on his face throughout that's different and on top of that apologizing don't be enough bro like anybody you know with common sense to know like okay if i'm in this courtroom i'm a well i'm, I'm not gonna say in all cases but some people know like at least let me try to act sympathetic or at least let me try to you know act like i actually give up you know about what happened i mean I can say some people, they only start crying or they only care because they know some some of them sentences and will smack them right in the face. But a lot of the times, bro, like how they be trying to act, you know, fake remorseful and all that, bro, that don't take back none of that. Like, you know, causing traumatic experiences to somebody's family, then trying to, you know, act remorseful after that, that don't go hand to hand. That don't match. Jennifer Mee. In another life, Jennifer Mee could have been a reality star or social media influencer. Jennifer certainly could draw public attention and demonstrated this when she first burst into the limelight in 2007. The then 15-year-old gained national fame when she developed an unusual case of uncontrollable hiccups. I get real bad chest pain, abdominal pain, throat pain, back pain. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Mee's search for a cure to the hiccups earned her the nickname Hiccup Girl. And during that time, she appeared on several television shows nationwide in a bid to find a lasting solution to her hiccups. After suffering the mysterious symptoms for over a month, the hiccups finally stopped when she was treated by Dr. Bob Lind. Although the media attention reduced drastically after she was treated, Mee continued to make the headlines, albeit for the wrong reasons. In June 2007, when she ran away from home, it was reported in the newspaper. Also in 2010. Hey, stop training people in person. Brandon, every time. I get it, man. Like, I, I like what you're doing, bro. I like your fitness stuff, but I'm trying to do a video, man. To make money as a Black boy. It's trash. A missing person report for me was issued by the St. Petersburg Police. From here, things just continued to go downhill for Jennifer Me. Me's problems began when she started dating a man named Lamont Newton in 2010. She was just 18 at the time, and together with a third accomplice, Laren Rayford, they formed an arm.
Bruh. Who the f She was just 18 at the time, and together with a Bruh, who the oh, Bruh! What I cut? Yeah. Third accomplice, Laren Rayford. They formed an armed robbery gang that targeted unsuspecting victims from social networking sites. In October 2010, Jennifer met a 22-year-old man, Shannon Griffin. Do y'all see why I be jelling now? Do y'all see? Like sometimes I try to do these videos straight through without pausing it, without saying my. It's like I can't help it though. Like come on, bro. Y'all. Fucking sites in October 20. Bro, who the fuck? Let me, let me, let me, let me go on with the video. 2010, Jennifer met a 22-year-old man, Shannon Griffin, online and lured him to a vacant home days later. Once the duo arrived at the home, me led Griffin to the back where Newton and Rayford had already laid an ambush. Griffin was shot multiple times with a .38 caliber handgun. Me and her friends then made off with less than $1.50 of his money, leaving him to die from the bullet wounds. All three suspects were arrested just a few hours after Griffin's body was discovered. Their arrest was relatively easy, given that the trio had been living together until the police captured them. All three friends were- What? Like, bro, y'all do stuff like this and don't be moving smart at all. I don't, con I don't condone trying to move smart in this type of context in any way, like, doing these type of things that move smart. But, like, bro, y'all make it so, I don't know, unless they actually probably really didn't care. I understand it was coming anyway, but I'm looking like, bro, what? You did all that and it stayed together. Like, bro, that don't, that don't even be making sense. And then to have less than $50? What, so I was going to buy some laundry detergent and probably, what, order some DoorDash? Come on, bro. We, we was going to buy some probably gain laundry detergent and buy some DoorDash. We already know DoorDash the higher than the mother. You get what I'm saying? Mill from Popeye's come up to 39 come up to what, thirty ninety two. Then you probably going to give a tip. I know y'all, y'all ugly motherfuckers. I know y'all probably uh, tip cheap, too. You get what I'm saying? So what? Probably what? Let's say mill thirty ninety two. Took the Uber driver three dollars. You get what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you only got what? Probably what, seven dollars left, seven eight dollars left. Like, come on, man. Subsequently charged with first degree murder, although the police were able to establish that Jennifer Mee had not pulled the trigger. In November 2010, Jennifer Mee appeared at a Pinellas County court hearing to convince a judge to release her on bail. Although she didn't speak during the hearing, the microphone amplified her loud sobs and hiccuping as she stood next to attorney John Trevino, who implored the judge to release her on bail because she posed no flight risks. Griffin's cousin Doug Bolden also spoke at the hearing, and he recalled how excited Griffin was about his date with me. Doug said, He was going to go on a date. He just said he was going on a date. Just a young, how kids can grin an ear to ear. About to go on a date. As happy as could be. Following Doug Bolden's passionate plea, Jennifer Mee was denied bail by the judge and remanded in prison. Nearly three years after Griffin's death, Pinellas County Judge Nancy Motley found Jennifer Mee guilty of first-degree murder. Um, the jury having found you guilty of murder in the first degree, Miss Mee, I will adjudicate you guilty and sentence you to life in prison without parole. On hearing the verdict, Jennifer Mee began to weep uncontrollably and at the same time held her head with her hands. The look on her face was that of someone suddenly hit with the reality that her life was ruined. Jennifer Mee sobbed some more as she was led out of the courtroom to resume her jail cell. Like, listen, bro, I don't judge. We've done a lot of stupid stuff in life, but it's just some stuff you got to understand what comes with that stuff, though. These people really be expecting to do all this and not have no type of consequences to them. Like, bro, y'all be in here smiling, looking for it, looking to get a year or something. Like, you really sit up here, I bet, you know, let me see. I'm kind of bored today. Let me go call traumatic experiences to, let's say, three people. Or let's say, let me do some bullshit to a random person. And then, like, I bet, you know, when I get in the courtroom, hope the judge don't be on some bullshit. Probably give me a year or something. Like, what? Like, y'all, bro, y'all be wanting two months? Y'all be wanting two months after doing stuff like this. So you look up and you want to get two months. Yeah, I'm going to do some bullshit in January. Case probably going to drag a little bit. So if I get sentenced in March, you know, by May, I'm trying to get out. And y'all had to, you know, do the little shit on my fingers, you know. I think ain't that good at math, so y'all take it easy on them, brother. I love y'all, though. But you get what I'm saying, though? So you get sentenced in March, and you want to get out. You want to get out in May, right? You want to get out in May. March 15th, you go in. May 16th, you want me right back on the block. Shit don't work like that. Thanks.
Mackenzie Sherilla. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Oh, and it, ooh, she gotta be Jewish or something. She gotta be Jewish or something. She petite as hell. Just how I like him, y'all. I love me a petite girl. I swear to God. Mackenzie Sherilla. Hell hath no fury. Yo, like, yo, no bullshit, bro. She sexier than a mother. No bullshit. Like, I ain't even caring with you right now. Like I said, she got to be Jewish or something, though, bro. Like, she bad as hell. But, you know, due to the fact of character-wise, no. You know, like, but, but like, I'm talking about, like, besides aesthetic-wise, you know, like, her, like, being eye-catching, you know, besides that, he's a fucked up person. Like a woman scorned. And in this case, Mackenzie Shirella became hell on earth for her victims. Boyfriend Dominic Russo and his pal Davian Flanagan. As she executed a death sentence on them using her Toyota Camry car. For this cowardly act. Hi, my name is Solange. I'm in kindergarten. Uh, Kip Secret Cabinet. Hi, my name is Solange. I'm in kindergarten. You know what? I was going to complain about that ad, but you know, baby girl, I'm proud of you. And it, Kip, you know, um, that's a school, that's in the neighborhood, you know. So, baby girl, I want you to do good. I want you to um, to succeed at whatever you're doing. But I still got to do my video. No hard feelings towards you, though. Keep doing you. Keep being you. Do it. Explore ahead, Annie. Kenzie Shirilla rightly earned the nickname Hell on Wheels. Shirilla and Dominic Russo were an item for several months, and most of their social media followers believed all was well with the young lovers. They See, bro, that's what we be trying to tell y'all, bro. Stop believing that bullshit. Like, I had to get passionate about that, bro. Stop believing that. Like, a lot of y'all, you know, be falling for absolutely nothing, bro. I've been saying this for years. A couple will post a picture doing literally nothing, holding hands in front of the beach, and they got 6,000 shares talking about some wish that could be me. You never had somebody held your hand before? Like, damn, you bro, y'all that lonely? Somebody never held your hand before. Nobody ever did this. You get what I'm saying? On the beach. Yeah, you know, I wish that could be me and my man. Or they tagging their boyfriends. Why you don't treat me like this? Like, bro. You you should have been tagging your boyfriend over a post of somebody having their hands held. Yeah, bro, I ain't, I ain't holding your hand because I don't want to hold that shit. You get what I'm saying? Now you're arguing with your man. You get what I'm saying? Probably be ugly as hell arguing. Yeah, bro, I don't want to hold that shit. Fuck. Boy, we don't got to be together. <laughs> like, come on, bro. I said I'm there arguing about that. I'm jealous. She ain't going down like that. Regularly shared, loved up photos and videos on their social media profiles, which sold the narrative to many of their social media friends that the duo was the real deal. However, behind the scenes, this was far from the truth. The love they once shared seemingly fizzled out, and the duo constantly fought and argued. Their relationship became so toxic that threats became common, and at this point, Russo decided it was time to quit. This was the obvious solution for any right-thinking person, but Shirilla saw Russo as her and decided that death was the only way out of the relationship. So around 5.30 a.m. on July 31st, 2022, the then 17-year-old drove her Toyota Camry at over 100 miles per hour and rammed into a large brick building at the intersection of Progress and Alameda Drives in Strongsville. There were two other occupants in the car at the time of the crash. Mackenzie Shirilla's boyfriend, Dominic Russo, who was 18 then, and his 17-year-old pal Davian Flanagan. The two were pronounced dead at the crash scene, while Shirilla miraculously survived, but was hospitalized. Although Shirilla has continued to maintain her innocence and claims she has no recollection of what led to the crash, her actions after the collision were somewhat unnerving for a person who was meant to be mourning the loss of her soulmate. Following the crash, Shirilla searched the internet for Los Angeles modeling jobs while still in her hospital bed. After she was discharged from the hospital, Shirilla attended a music concert in her wheelchair and later recorded a TikTok video for Halloween, where she was seen dancing with friends in what looked like a corpse costume. These were some of the points made by the prosecution during the double murder trial. Prosecutors all... And see, y'all, look, that's why it's really important uh, about what you post on social media and everything, because... A lot of y'all, you know, be thinking y'all be safe just because nothing happened. But, bro, like, when shit hit the fan, bro, they got all that stuff. These motherfuckers will pull up a picture from 2017 when you had your little ass mohawk and, you know, big ass shirt on. you like, bro, what the fuck? Like, you like, bro, come on. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Yeah. You got my shit cut, bro. You like, bro. 
Gonna be ugly as hell in the courtroom with your shit up there. Yeah, bro, shit fresh, huh? Like, bro, big ass white shirt. What's up, bro? You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, bro, that's crazy. And see, a lot of the times, bro, you really can save yourself the trouble, but sometimes shit get too deep. Like, even for me, right? There's a lot of points in life, like, you know, I'm going to just give an example of, I can say, dodging a bullet, you know. You ever had, you know, somebody you was kicking it with or somebody you was cool with and then, you know, stuff fizzle out and you feel some type of way about it and you want to rekindle things or, you know, something that's constantly on your mind, but then at the same time, you look at it as, like, you know, it ended for a reason, so you try to look at everything as a blessing, you know. Sometimes stuff get too deep, and the stuff that was supposed to end or the stuff that wasn't going to go good anyway, a lot of the time, be grateful when that shit just drop or when that shit, you know, um, stop being set in stone and, you know, fizzle out another way without the, uh, without the drama to it. That's the best way you could do that because... When it comes to these points of being toxic and then, you know, like, like the emotions are built up and things go too far, a lot of the times it ain't no going back. And you see, that was a result of this, you know. He probably, did, I'm sure he didn't think that was going to happen or they probably was in the car like, oh, fuck are you doing that a lot? Why are you going so fast? And then, you know, looked up and now, you know, him and his brother, you know, I'm going to say chose to go, you know, not chose, but, you know, him and his brother went, went another route. That's all I'm saying. So that's why a lot of the times I be grateful, man. Sometimes that shit might suck. Like a bomb might end or, you know, something might not go right or interaction don't even get nowhere. But you never know what you're getting saved from, though. Like no bullshit. Also explored the problematic relationship Cirillo shared with Russo and used it to provide more evidence against her. The prosecution detailed how Cirillo had become threatening towards her boyfriend in the weeks leading to the crash. According to witness, two weeks before the crash, she had threatened to crash her car while driving with Russo because they had an argument. Had she observed at that time the defendant striking Dominic Russo with both hands and that he overheard her make a statement. Uh, an admissible statement, and she said, Dominic, I'm going to crash this car. How do you take 20,000 children? And see, I only because I love New York, we're going to let it rock for two more seconds. We love New York City without anybody saying That's it. Put your ass out here. We find that it is especially and important to her state of mind just two weeks later when she used the car to kill Dominic or so. Unsurprisingly, the video evidence was pivotal in helping Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge Nancy Margaret Russo reach a verdict during the August 14, 2023, sentencing of Mackenzie Shirella. While specifically highlighting the crash video, the judge said, This is the type of evidence you can never unsee. You can never forget the visual or audio of this incident. It's chilling and tragic. As you review that exhibit, you know that you are watching oncoming deaths of two people, and there's nothing that can stop it. As the judge read out her pre-sentencing speech, Mackenzie Shirilla sobbed uncontrollably as it slowly dawned on her where the verdict was headed. Before delivering the verdict, the judge pointed out how Shirilla had visited the crash route, an obscure route that is usually not taken by her, a few days before the crash and echoed the stand of the prosecutors that her actions were premeditated. She acted knowing that her actions could bring harm not only to the occupants in the vehicle, but also to pedestrians. Judge Russo, who isn't related to Dominic Russo, wrapped up by emphasizing that there was no doubt that Shirilla intended to kill her boyfriend. In her word, She had a mission and she executed it with precision. The mission was death. She added, Her actions were controlled and deliberate. She knew the time was coming. She knew she had to do it. 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 Judge Nancy Margaret Russo found Mackenzie Shirilla guilty of killing both Dominic Russo and Davian Flanagan. She subsequently sentenced her to two concurrent 15 years to life sentences. As Shirilla was handcuffed by officers, she began to cry uncontrollably. And see, a lot of the, like I said, a lot of the, like, a lot of the crying come from, like, the unexpected sentence. Like, you know, it don't actually come from crying due to the fact that, you know, what they did. Because if that was the case, a lot of them, even beforehand, just knowing that, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a mission to cause traumatic experiences to my boyfriend. And, you know, for you to be in the car driving that fast, knowing that your mission is to do, like, this and that. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, that, all that stuff would have dawned then. A lot of them just be crying at the sentence, thinking that acting remorseful, you know, like, will show some type of sympathy and have the judge, you know, ease up a little bit. Like, you know, this person is really sorry. Like, bro, in certain contexts, sorry don't mean anything. You get what I'm saying? Like, it's cool, but sorry don't fix everything. 
Mackenzie Shirella was then escorted out of the court to start her. Bro, who security think he is? Bro, y'all look, look at the hand. Bro, hold up. She began to cry uncontrollably. Mackenzie Shirella. Bro, who the f- <laughs> Like, bro, who, bro, who you think he is? Come on, one more time. As Shirella was handcuffed Hold on, what do you do? She began to cry uncontrollably. Me. Mackenzie Shirella. Bro, who the f- Yeah, go. Like, bro, who you think, bro? Bro, I don't know. Let me turn the air on, bro. Bro, I don't know who he think he is. Look at the hand. Bro was then escorted out of the court to start her prison sentence. Like, bro. Aiden Fucci. This is 14-year-old Aiden Fucci making his appearance at St. John's County Courtroom, Florida. Do not be deceived by his harmless look as the teenager deliberately threw the whole of St. John's County community into mourning, faced when he fatally stabbed his schoolmate Tristan Bailey 114 times. Wait, oh, I remember this one. Just when I um, just when I heard the name, but, but um, but um, damn, he looked different as hell back when I saw it though. I don't know if it's if it's he got a different hairstyle just when he had hit the courtroom, but. I remember he had long hair, and that was when he was in the back of the cop car, and he was skinny. Although Fucci and Bailey attended Patriot Oaks Academy in St. John's County, Florida, Bailey was more involved in school activities and was part of the school's cheerleading squad. She was one of five children of Stacy and Forrest Bailey and lived with her family in Durban Crossing in northwest St. John's County, which was very close to where Aiden Fucci lived. On the night of her death, Fucci convinced the 13-year-old cheerleader to leave home and meet him at a friend's place. That same day, video footage from a residence captures two people believed to be Fucci and Bailey walking east on Saddlestone Drive, which is very close to where her body was discovered toward the end of a retention pond. At some point, Fucci was able to lure Bailey to a secluded area where he launched a vicious attack on her, stabbing her 114 times, with an autopsy later revealed that at least 49 of those were defensive wounds. On May 9, 2021, Bailey was reported missing by her family after she vanished from their home. While a search was going on for the missing cheerleader, Aiden Fucci took to Snapchat to share a post, holding up a peace sign at the back of a police patrol vehicle alongside his best friend. The image was accompanied by a message that read, Hey guys, has anybody sick seen Tristan lately? However, Fucci's inquest didn't get the sort of response he was hoping for. As one particular commenter wrote, You were with her, Aiden. Know what happened to her. Later that Sunday, Tristan's body was found in a retention pond close to her home. A murder investigation was immediately launched that led police straight to Aiden Fucci, and he was arrested on May 10th, 2021, as the prime suspect. Fucci initially claimed he had nothing to do with the murder, but his story continued to change throughout his interrogation. Eventually, Fucci claimed he and Tristy got into an argument, and he pushed her to the ground, where she accidentally hit her head. Fucci made these false claims, unaware of the amount of evidence that investigators already had on him. From speaking to his friends and girlfriend, investigators had established that Fucci often fantasized about killing people and he precisely bro what be bro what be wrong with y'all like bro like you fantasize about causing traumatic experiences bro so much to fantasize about like bro you can fantasize about literally anything you, you get what I'm saying like for me I'm fantasizing about how how much y'all ugly motherfuckers laughing about when I be gelling that's what bring me happiness you get what I'm saying for me to gel on here and make y'all happy Y'all my people like y'all niggas. But I'm saying, like, bro, what be wrong with y'all, bro? Like... The detailed murder plans involving dragging a random person into the woods and stabbing them. Aiden Fucci's girlfriend also told investigators that he always carried a knife and often talked about killing people, even her. She said he enjoyed coming up from behind her. Bro, I'm trying to be cool! Like, bro, I'm trying to be cool, little ass freckles. Like, bro. And pretending to slit her throat. She admitted that even though it was a bit unsettling, they never took any of his utterances seriously. A ton of physical evidence was also recovered that pointed to Aiden Fucci as Bailey's killer. A buck knife with a missing tip was found near her body, matching fragments lodged in Bailey's scalp. The knife was later identified as Fucci's. There is also the security video that showed Fucci and Bailey close to the murder area, and some DNA evidence. Also, a search of Aiden Fucci's home provided a mountain of evidence that was more than enough to prove his guilt. Detectives also found 
found wet, blood-stained shoes and clothing in his room, blood and dirt on the drain by the bathroom sink, and blood-stained denim jeans in a laundry basket. On February 6, 2023, we are always gonna be... Yo, that previous case blew me so much. Now that I'm editing it, I ain't even notice I got stuck. I'm like, bro, what the fuck? I was looking at the ad play, then I'm like, why I press it so late when the other ones I oh uh, I skipped immediately? Yo, that shit had me going crazy. Fucci pleaded guilty to the first degree murder of Tristan Bailey. Even though he was 16 at the time, he was tried as an adult due to the gruesome nature of his crime and the premeditation that went into it. I just want to say I'm not getting it. Uh, you know, I'm sorry for the Bailey family and my family. During his sentencing at the St. Johns County courtroom on March 24, 2023, Judge R. Lee Smith emphasized the impact the murder had on the community while reading his verdict report. He said, I would submit that this case is probably the most difficult and shocking case that this county, St. Johns County, has, has dealt with. In the 20 years that I have been, 16 years that I have been practicing law, even though Fucci paid close attention to Smith's verdict report, he remained stoic and showed no emotion, preferring to shake his head a few times. Mr. Fucci, having entered a plea of guilty to the crime of first-degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison. Even when the judge found him guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey, there was no visible reaction or emotion from him. Just a cold, lifeless look that would give the faint-hearted nightmares. The judge nah, trust me, that shit hit, bro. Like, these, these niggas not hard, bro. You get what I'm saying? That stuff hit after a while. I mean, of course, some people let it all out in front of everybody, and some people want to act slowly like it don't touch them. Think about it, bro. 16 years, 16 years old and knowing that you never touching outside again. Besides, like, when y'all probably go outside in jail, you know, like, how that is. But I'm talking about, actually, you know, when it comes to calling up the homies and doing certain stuff, like, knowing you never touching that again, bro, come on. That stuff hit. These people don't be hard, bro. I imposed a life sentence on him to ensure he wouldn't be causing any more problems in St. John's County or anywhere else. However, his age at the time of the crime means he would be eligible for parole after serving 25 years out of his sentence. Philip Chisholm. Although Philip Chisholm might look like any other teenager, the ninth grader at Danvers High School, Massachusetts, was only 14 when he appeared at Salem Superior Court to first-degree murder, armed robbery, and rape charges after brutalizing his 24-year-old math teacher, Colleen Ritzer, inside the school toilet. Friends, family, and colleagues described Ritzer as a shining light with a bubbling personality who loved to put a smile on everyone's face. This kind of nature eventually put her in harm's way when she innocently asked Chisholm to stay after school so she could help him with some math problems. Unknown to Ritzer, Chisholm had already developed a sinister plan to end her life days before. But why would a 14-year-old student want his teacher dead? Philip Chisholm never provided any explanations for his actions, but a student who had witnessed a minor fallout between Ritzer and Chisholm provided some investigators with some insight. The student witness recalled seeing Chisholm get visibly upset when Ritzer innocently referred to his recent move from Tennessee during a discussion with him. The teenager relocated to Massachusetts from Tennessee with his mom, who was going through a bitter divorce with his dad. Even though Ritzer quickly changed the topic, Chisholm still appeared upset, and the student witness later observed him talking to himself. Several hours after that fallout, Philip Chisholm had done the unthinkable, and footage captured by the school's newly installed security camera system showed that it was premeditated. On the morning of October 22, 2013, the security cameras showed Chisholm arriving at school with several bags, which were put in his locker. Inside the bags were a mask, box cutter, and change of clothing, tools he intended to use to carry out his evil plot. Around 2.45 p.m., Ritzer was recorded exiting the classroom and heading for the second floor women's bathroom. A few moments later, Chisholm peeps into the hallway in the direction of Ritzer before ducking back into the classroom. He then re-emerges with his hood over his head, trails Ritzer, and pulls on gloves before entering the same bathroom. Once inside the bathroom, Philip Chisholm robs Colleen Ritzer of her iPhone, credit cards, and underwear before raping and stabbing her 16 times in the neck with a box cutter. Between 3.07 7 p.m. and 3.16 p.m. Chisholm was captured on the security camera wearing several different outfits and going around the parking lot and classrooms before finally returning to the bathroom. He then put Ritzer's body inside a recycle bin and hauled it outside the school through an elevator. He dragged the bin to a wooded area outside the school where he again raped Ritzer's lifeless body, but this time with a tree branch. After this act of savagery, Chisholm went on about his day like nothing had happened and even left school early enough to purchase movie tickets with Ritzer's credit card. What? Yo, what the f- Bruh, 
this, bro, is this shit real? Bro, hold, y'all, we gotta run that whole thing back. Now, this this one caught me off guard the most. I swear, I swear to God, I can't even jail off this one. Like, you know, a lot of times when, you know, it's the regular, it like, I'm not gonna say regular cases, but, you know, like, it's the same cases back to back. Like, okay, you know, like, uh, you know, manslaughter or this and that. It's like, you know, even though it's still fucked up, it's like, all right. But, yo, this one, bro? Bro, bro movie tickets? Bro, mo- movie tickets? The movies? And put Richard's body inside a recycle bin and hauled it outside the school through an elevator. He dragged... Let me make sure we still rolling good, though. What we got? Ah, uh, hold up. What the hell? Hey, right, there we go. All right, 44 minutes, all right, cool. Look, I had somebody in lay on it. ...the bin to a wooded area outside the school, where he again raped Ritzer's lifeless body, but this time with a tree branch. After this act of savagery, Chisholm went on about his day like nothing had happened, and even left school early enough to purchase movie tickets with Ritzer's credit card. While all of this was happening, a search had already begun for Chisholm, after he was pinned as the main culprit following... Bro, the movies, though. What the f... What the, like, think about it. After that, how can you even concentrate watching a movie? And what the f- you want to go see? What the hell is in it? What do you want to go see? Bruh. When Ritzer's mysterious disappearance and the discovery of blood in the bathroom, the bloody recycle bin, and her blood-stained clothing near the cross-country path in the woods behind the school. Curiously, Philip Chisholm was the only person affiliated with the school who was also missing. Philip Chisholm was arrested around 12.30 a.m. the next day while walking along a darkened highway outside Danvers. When the police searched Chisholm, they found several items belonging to Ritzer in his possession, including her underwear, credit cards, and purse, as the box cutter covered with dried blood. After interrogation, police got information from Chisholm that led them to discover Colleen Ritzer's half-naked body around 3 a.m., and it was a gruesome sight. A tree branch was left hanging from her vagina, and detectives also found a handwritten note by Chisholm that read, I hate you all. The death of Colleen Ritzer, a much-loved member of the faculty of Danvers High School, sent shockwaves through the whole... I buy the same products you do, only I get them much cheaper. I save hundreds of dollars a month by doing this one simple... <laughs> yeah, bro! I save hundreds of dollars by doing this! Yeah, bro! I save mad money! Hey, bro, come on! Little ass bang! Yeah, bro! I save money by doing this! Mm, bro! whole community and through the morning there were still loud protests for justice to be meted out to her killer despite his age consequently philip chisholm was tried as an adult even though he was only 14 when he committed the heinous crimes during his sentencing on february 6th 2016 friends family colleagues and students of the 24 year old math teacher stormed the courtroom to demand that philip chisholm be sent to prison for the rest of his life in the victim impact statements colleen richard's loved ones detailed their pain and explained how difficult life has been for them since Richard was brutally snatched from them. One of the people who spoke at the sentencing was Colleen Richard's brother, and he didn't mince any words when describing the kind of verdict he thought Philip Chisholm deserved. Put this animal behind bars for the maximum possible sentence. Do not give this coward the opportunity to shatter another family's lungs. These sentiments were re-echoed by Colleen Richard's mother, who described her daughter's killer as pure evil that can never be rehabilitated. Chisholm remained expressionless as he watched the victim's family and friends tearfully describe the pain the loss had brought upon them. There was nothing in his demeanor that suggested he felt any remorse for his actions, much less regret. After hearing all the various victim impact statements, the judge sentenced Philip Chisholm to at least 40 years in prison for the rape and murder of Colleen Ritzer. On hearing the verdict, his mother, who was in the courtroom, broke down in tears. However, Chisholm showed no emotion as he was handcuffed out of the courtroom. Shit. L. Jackson. Our final story is perhaps the most shocking reaction to a life sentence that you have ever seen. Instead of remorse, Shandell Jackson showed contempt and arrogance right from the moment he murdered 21-year-old University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee film student Nathan Potter to his sentencing at the Milwaukee County Circuit Court. In July 2009, Jackson and an accomplice, Derek J. Thomas, accosted Potter as he walked to his River West apartment in the 2500 block of N. Dousman Street. Their intention was to rob him, but when they found out he had no money, Shondell Jackson pulled out a gun and shot Nathan Potter in the chest. What? Uh, y'all, I'm gonna 
need some damn lean after this, man. Son of put me right on my damn back, cause ain't no way. You found out he didn't have any money and got mad. Found out he had no money, Shondell Jackson pulled out a gun and shot Nathan Potter in the chest. It was a senseless killing that didn't have to happen, but Jackson's thirst for blood and violence was apparently on overdrive, as he was involved in another non-fatal shooting on that same day. The then 19-year-old was arrested shortly after killing a film student, but no one was prepared for the sort of drama that unfolded thereafter. In February 2010, a jury found Jackson guilty of being a party to a crime of first-degree intentional homicide and attempted robbery of Nathan Potter. However, Jackson shocked everyone in the courtroom with his reaction to the verdict as he turned to his victim's family and rained obscenities at them. A few minutes after this strange outburst, Jackson is being led out of the courtroom by deputies, and just as he reaches the door, he turns towards the Potters and laughs. A few months later, during Shandell Jackson's sentencing, Assistant District Attorney Mark Williams played footage of that disgraceful moment for Milwaukee County Circuit Judge Rebecca Dallet in a bid to demonstrate Jackson's unremorsefulness and get her to rule out any possibility of parole. After the tape was played, Nathan Potter's father, John Potter, got a chance to address the court, and in between heavy sobs, he urged the judge to put Jackson away for good. He said, Judge, there's nothing that can be said to bring back our Nathan. But, but your sentence can ensure that Shondell does not have the opportunity as a free man to inflict pain like this again. Is there such thing as pure evil? We think so. In the end, the tactic employed by the prosecution proved to be successful as Judge Dallet sentenced Shondell Jackson to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The verdict provoked a violent outburst from Jackson in which he aimed a string of obscenities at the judge as well as the victim's family. Eventually, he had to be wrestled down, pepper sprayed, and physically restrained by three deputies. The scenes threw the court into momentary pandemonium, and members of Jackson's family seized the opportunity to taunt the Potters. While screaming support for Jackson as he was led out of the courtroom by deputies, one woman could be heard saying to the Potter family, most of the people who attended the sentencing were left appalled by the behavior of Jackson's family, especially the Potters. Speaking to reporters after the sentencing, the victim's father, John Potter, was visibly confused by the hate directed at his family while repeatedly stating that they had done nothing to warrant such treatment. He ended by stating that he hoped that Jackson would come to terms with his actions at some point and learn to value human life while spending the rest of his life behind bars. For more content like this, click on the video showing on your screen now. Damn. Therapy, for me, came at a time that was really pivotal. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 51, I bet. Yo, I did not know, like, this own, um, these courtroom channels had, like, you know, all this to it, you know. Of course, I watch simple, like, you know, courtroom cases, maybe a video for a minute or two, but, like, the sequel set them back to back, like, yo, some crazy people out here. Y'all, I appreciate y'all for rocking with me, man. This was a good video. Let me know if y'all want more of these. I'm gonna still do more of these, though, but y'all just let me know if you want more of them. And I got y'all with some good content. More T-Money So Funny videos coming out, you feel what I'm saying? You dig? But, y'all, it's your boy Kim Money Bad back with another video, man. Love y'all niggas. I'm out. Yeah. Turn up with your dogs or you gon' turn up by yourself You gon' go get on your grind or you gon' sit and ask for help They call Brody by himself